Good morning and welcome to the webinar today. My name is Carrie Berger and I'm the project coordinator for the Northwest Fire Science Consortium. You are listening to the third webinar in our fall webinar series on communication and fire. To avoid any noise interference, I have muted your audio, so if you have a question, please type that into the chat box. I'd also like to let you know that I will be recording the webinar today and will archive it on our website and YouTube channel. You can find those addresses listed in the chat box. Also in the chat box is a link to the paper that our guests will be re referencing today in their presentation. Okay, so we are fortunate to have two guest speakers today. I'll introduce first Travis Fubalio, who is an assistant professor of natural resource sociology in the Department of Natural Resources and Society at the University of Idaho. His research focuses on the human and policy dimensions of wildfire management with an overarching emphasis on the ways that the diverse populations adapt to changing wildfire risk and develop relationships with the landscape. We also have with us Matt Carroll, who is a forester and a natural resource sociologist in the School of Environment at Washington State University. His research is concerned with the relationships of human communities and populations to land and natural resources with a particular emphasis on public lands in the U.S. So Travis and Matt, thank you so much for being here with us today, and you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you for the introduction. This is Travis Valio. Matt and I are going to do a bit of a handoff as we go through here. Uh, it seems only fitting given that Matt and I have been working on these ideas and kind of a longitudinal approach to understanding community adaptation for quite some time. So we'll do a couple handoffs, but the larger goal here is to talk about this idea of how communities adapt to fire, that dynamic process, and what we've learned over the years, myself doing it a little bit more than a decade, Matt, for longer, in looking at these communities and seeing patterns that emerge in the way that adaptation occurs and the fact that we need to, need to better tailor some of our approaches to fire management in lieu of the local conditions that you may find in a place. So I don't need to go through too much of the background. I was able to see a number of the people who are here and I know that there's a good background in the fire problem as you explain it there, but a lot of us have focused on either through policy or through directorates, the wild and urban interface, which has much of a spatial connotation to it, uh, and most people take it that way. We also see it as something that has a longer tradition of looking really at relationships between people and the land. And so the Wild and Urban Interface in its early conceptions was really about looking at what would be a human and landscape ecotone, where you're gonna have people with very different understandings and impressions of how that landscape should be managed and especially that may be at different risks from wildfire or may have different capabilities to deal with it. And so we think that spatial definition is very important, but what we've done over the years is try to look at the way that longitudinally these results that we see from a number of studies show that not any one given thing explains why it is that people perform certain activities or adapt to fire. So we may be asking people, to perform work in the home ignition zone between 100 and 200 feet of their home, reducing fuels, those kind of things. And you'll see from studies of various people, Pam Jakes, uh, I saw Hannah Brankert smiths on the call, a number of, of groups of people that have done this work. And you see that in some places, people are very apt to take on these mitigations or to maybe perform CWPPs or to adopt uh, a formal version of a FireWise program. In other places, they aren't. And so really it gets at this idea that there's a lot of complexity in the WUI. And if you look up there in the top right corner of this slide, for those of you who are looking, you're seeing what was a version of the community cluster analysis from the cohesive strategy. And it's one of those recognitions that we want to understand the differences in different places. Now, there are some issues with that and ways that we think that our work augments that in that this is done often at the county scale. And for many of you who work with individual populations, you know that scale is a very important thing to be dealing with in wildfire adaptation. And while the data that most people will use to maybe get at something like vulnerability exists at the county scale, it's often that you see populations and functional units of people who will work together at much smaller scales than that. The other issue that occurs with a lot of those approaches, and we've shown in a number of studies that we've done, is that the characteristics that we do have longitudinal data for or uniform data for 
aren't always the best ones to predict what it is that are going to explain why people choose to adapt in the ways that they do. There's often all of these other characteristics, the relationship people have, the landscape, their knowledge of fire in the area, how long they've lived there, whether or not they're willing to work with other people or whether there's long-term conflicts. Those kind of things aren't necessarily well characterized by some of that data. So over the years, uh, coming from more of a qualitative side and then eventually bringing that into a quantitative side as well, we were trying to find what it would be that would be better data to be collecting at this very small scale that can help feed up and provide a bottom-up perspective of the diversity of these communities and the diversity of these different types of populations who are all at risk from wildfire but may have different ways of dealing with it. And this is Matt, interject one brief comment here, and that is that we do not assume that we know in advance what we think people should be doing in a given situation to, to uh, adapt to wildfire. We tend to ask the question, why are they doing, what are they doing, and perhaps what do they know that we don't know about their local situation? So our research does not assume that we in advance know what people ought to be doing, but we rely oftentimes on the wisdom that people who, who have lived in places for a long time uh, bring to the table. And we've been fortunate enough over time going in in that very inductive way of learning a lot from people like those who are on the call and work with these individual populations. And we've been able to see that across now, you know, dozens of communities across the West to be able to start to look at those patterns. So the slide I have up now talks about the vagueness or the opportunity of fire adapted communities. It's, it's a shout out to Pam Jakes and Dan Williams and some other folks who put together a paper about the vagueness of community wildfire protection plans potentially being genius. And this is a similar idea as fire adapted communities. Really, if you look at the, the policy and the director for it, it organizes a lot of things that had been going on or that were put forward as ways to help communities take some responsibility for the fire problem and help alleviate that burden on agencies or firefighters when the events occur. And so things like the FireWise program got subsumed under that, CWPPs, Jack Cohen's work on the home ignition zone, all of these different aspects, different incentives that may or may not work in terms of putting money down for fuels reduction programs, these all got subsumed under this larger issue. But one of the things that I think is useful and very important to remember, and this is why I say the means and the ends, is there's a tendency to want to take those things and make them a checklist or to make them a dependent variable and say if you have X, Y, and Z in place, you are automatically more fire adapted than another area. Now, the difficulty with that is, I think, more importantly, the idea of a fire adapted community is one where you're going to have people who are willing to take that responsibility and work with the existing strengths that they have and develop the things that maybe they need to work on. But it means that you're going to have some very different ways that people will adapt. And so as we'll see when we get a little bit further in this, when we started breaking down these communities into different types, you'll notice that some people are much more apt to take some effort on reducing fuels in a big swath next to a community, whereas others are more interested in collectively working on their individual properties. Some may be more willing to join the rural fire district and be a volunteer, while as others are going to maybe not have that knowledge and go in a different direction and set those things up as more of a professional sense. So this larger idea is that not all adaptability is going to look the same, and that comes from those differences, those differences in terms of the populations and how they've changed over time across this very dynamic landscape. So what we focus on instead is trying to foster some kind of tailored programming or some type of tailored set of incentives that are gonna better lead to some action that these people will take and continue to take over time. And that means understanding those conditions first and working with those people. And eventually it gets to the point of us trying to provide some kind of decision support that will help us give a systematic way to do that. One of the big things that's important in the approach that we've been getting at over the years is this notion of community. And our notion of community comes from more of a rural sociological perspective, and that really shows the way that community is an emergent property. It's not going to be just a census de definition. It's not going to be the boundaries of a given county or a given city. When we talk about community, really the first thing that we do when we go in and study these populations and look to see 
what might be the best ways for them to adapt to fire or what they do well or why they don't maybe adopt some sorts of programs is what's the functional unit of people who care about a place who are willing to work together and who have consistent ideas of the way that landscape should be managed. And those things can differ a lot. You may have some places that are much more on a utilitarian side and are looking at a very active management of a forest. Others that may be more interested in a recreation type of aspect to their nearby national forests or public lands, and they're interested in some restoration work that's going to have a slightly different target to them. So these people also have different risks and recovery needs. They may have some of them may have insurance, some of them may not have insurance. Some of them may conceive of that risk differently or be willing to accept more risk than others. And some of them, as we've pointed out in a very kind of straightforward way, is there's a number of places where people are, if you tell them that there's going to be a need to reduce fuels, they'll pull out their chainsaw and they'll start doing it. Other places, people have never started a chainsaw. So this WUI contains all of these different people. It's a very broad area in that spatial sense, but it's also very complex in terms of who you get. And so what we look for is that small functional unit, and it may be very different. So community is that emergent property that I think a lot of people who work with them could understand and do understand when we describe it and they're able to put them on a map, but it's gonna be shifting across that landscape. One of the things that's important with that is really when we look at this idea of fire adapted communities and the cohesive strategy, is the other, one of the other big tasks there is creating fire resilient landscapes. And obviously those two things are going to be interacting. You can't really have a fire resilient landscape unless you have fire adapted communities that are subsumed within it. Because most of the time we see the actions that are taken surrounding fire either before when it comes to the way we set up fuel treatments, during when it comes to the values at risk and the prioritization of where we put assets, and afterwards, in terms of landscape recovery or bear teams, that is all going to be somewhat dependent upon who is there in that landscape, whether or not the public had, had taken that responsibility and has the fire that passes through without causing a lot of damages, or what it is that they're using that landscape for. If it's a recreation area, there's plenty of studies that show that you're going to have a downtick potentially in people who are visiting those areas or recreating in them for a time. You're also going to be looking at potential impacts to watersheds and municipal watersheds. All of these make a difference. And so sometimes that's something that gets lost in this process, and I have a wildlife colleague who kept asking me about this particular point, and eventually I explained it to him in such a way that what you're really looking at is people in wooly landscapes have become a keystone species of what I call emergent microhabitats. We have them change their property in order to make it more resilient to fire. We have them potentially plant fire-resistant plants, but what we have also done is created an entirely new ecology for a whole region of the country, and understanding that interplay I think is really important and why fire adapted communities are something that we need to look at as these dynamic properties that are emerging in the landscape. So as a background, we started out looking at what I call kind of the unholy trinity of concepts that are out there right now. If you look a lot of people talk about vulnerability, resilience, or adaptive capacity when it comes to hazards or when it comes to change. And these have a lot of very defined traditions in a number of disciplines. But really, you're looking at vulnerability as being this potential exposure or sensitivity to some type of hazard, in our case, fire. Resilience being the ability to deal with those shocks or adapt as that change in condition creates more or less risk. The thing about this and why we started to focus on that centerpiece of adaptive capacity is that there are some things that you can do when it comes to reducing vulnerability. But there are some things you can't. So you can reduce fuels to be able to have some reduction in vulnerability, but unless you have a lot of equipment, you're probably not going to change the fact that a home or a series of homes is on a slope. Uh, on the resilient side, it's the same way. You may have policies that allow people to put in place certain standards or guidelines or codes that would reduce or make people more resilient to those fires when they do occur so that we might not have as many damages, but at the same token, there's only so much that you can do before you hit other policies or other restrictions. So we focused on this notion of adaptive capacity because adaptive capacity is the verb in that. It's what people can actually do. And so focusing on that ability to work with people to say, these are the things that you can do to take that responsibility seemed a very useful way to get at something we could work with communities on. Over time, uh, we started looking across that literature and we developed a 
conceptual idea of how that played out. And the idea there comes from this idea of emergent characteristics in that notion of community. That in any given place, you're gonna have these things that some people look for. Those being demographics, sometimes we're looking at income, we're looking at age. These things are common in the hazard literature and they're important as indicators. They're not necessarily as important in understanding why it is that people do what they do or why collectively they perform those behaviors. And so we started looking broadly at the other types of facets that might be in a community that we would want to bring to bear and how those things intersect to create more of a comprehensive narrative of that place, of those people, and why they do what they do. And so a lot of this got into things like place-based knowledge and experience, and there's plenty of literature on that, that people may have different connections to a place or may be more invested in doing something to reduce risk in that area or to keep it in a certain way. There's all of these informal interactions where you may have people who have lived in drainages for a very long time interact frequently, are willing to help each other, but they're not necessarily the type of joiners that are going to set up a very formal type of organization. And you may have ones that do set up those types of formal organizations. We wanted to be able to represent all of these things. And there's also that important lobe on the left side of the ability to access and adapt scientific and technical knowledge. So in the case of the good work that a number of people have done about reducing wildfire risk or working on restoration of landscapes, how is it that these people take that information and adapt it to their local context because we know it's going to be very different across these different areas. Now, that's a nice conceptual figure. It doesn't necessarily give us something practical to work with. And so what Matt and I have done over time is we've gone to these different communities and we wanted to find individual characteristics that we could use as potential starting points or indicators that people could hold on to and be able to tell that story for themselves. Because the point is not for us to go out and tell these communities what they need to do. It's to help the people who are working with them be able to see it the way that we can all collectively agree this is a good path forward for them, or these are the things that are really going to matter and are going to be different leverage points for working on creating a fire adapted community. So over time, and you don't need to look at all of these characteristics obviously, but we created what we call a corpus of characteristics. It doesn't mean that all of these things are indicators. And so some people see this and they get very frightened and say, well, there's no way I could put that if I'm doing something in a scientific research project. There's no way I can measure all of these things and look at some dependent variable. The thing to remember is we tend to look at this as more of an inductive process. Uh, we think that it's very important to confirm these relationships but it's also probably more important to understand and to be able to describe what's going on in a location if you're gonna work with these people. Proving it's a useful part and we can confirm some of those relationships, but really what we wanted out of this in a corpus is usually what you use in something more like a content analysis. It's all of the potential things that may be in a given place. So if you know all of the potentials, you can start to tell a story by seeing which of those characteristics is present in a place. And you can start to say, if some of these things are present in combinations, what outcomes does that lead to and why? So if you look at some of these characteristics, I've already mentioned some of them, but this presence of local champions, which is that third point, oftentimes, and there's plenty of research that shows in our confirmation with our studies that if you're gonna set up Firewise or set up a CWPP, there may be some very important people who already exist in that community that are well respected and that can carry these kind of ideas forward. Uh, in Firewise, they call them spark plugs, right? Very similar notion, but you may have a different intersection with some of the other aspects that are occurring. If this is a place where there's a high distrust of federal programs or potentially of the federal agencies that are managing fire risk in those areas, those local champions may become more important as the bridge, whereas in other cases, they may just be getting people's foot in the door to be able to work with those agencies. And so over time, what we've tried to do is look at the combinations that we tend to see in these communities and tend to see across all the great work that other people have done in wildfire social science and say, can we make some sense of all this diversity given these characteristics and given the combinations that we see? Given that, and because people had asked us to find kind of that more tangible association between these patterns, I will kick it over to Matt, who's gonna talk about our next step in that process. Okay, well, let me just say a, a couple of words before I get into the details here about the thought process that sort of led us to where we are today um, uh, uh, in this uh, in this area. Um, 
when Travis was doing his field work for his dissertation a number of years ago, we were in some communities in Southern California that we weren't as familiar with as, as I had been in, in, in doing all the work that I've done in other places um, uh, around fire. And uh, so here we are in a, in a place where the average home value is a million dollars or a million and a half dollars. Uh, so money is clearly not the issue that these people are um, is not the limitation uh, uh, for these folks to adapt to, uh, to to fire risk. And I re reflected back on some other communities, let's say Ashland, Montana, in uh, in eastern Montana, central Montana, where the um, uh, the, the better homes were double wides um, and uh, where the average income obviously way lower than that community in Southern California. But both of these communities were contained within what the federal government refers to as the wildland urban interface. And it really hit us that the social complexity of the WUI had never really been, been uh, come to grips with it, if you will. And so that really set us off um, uh, on this idea that we needed to understand the social complexity of the WUI if we were going to understand uh, the responses um, that the various people within the WUI have to fire and to fire risk. We obviously had a lot more information about the complexity of forest and grassland ecosystems than we did the, com the social complexity of the WUI. And so that really led us uh, uh, to the point where we are today in, in, in advocating this particular uh, way to try to understand the problem. So turning now to the details, um, we asked ourselves the question, given all case studies that I and others had done over the years, around fire and, and, and response to fire, can the WUI be segmented into types of communities that are sufficiently different from each other such that we can begin to understand why one type of community might respond in one way and another type of community might respond in another way to um, a fire event or the, or the future potential of a fire event. And so um, it was really Travis's idea to, to take all this case study research that, uh, that, uh, that had already been done, and to create the, a, a notion of a community archetype. For those of you that are sociologically trained, this is kind of tied in some ways to Max Weber's uh, classic idea of an ideal type. And the idea of an archetype is, is not that every community will necessarily fit perfectly into a particular box, but that, but that if we can if we can understand sort of key characteristics that groups of communities have, um, th this notion of archetype could be a, a heuristic device, a way to, to try to understand the, the, the complexity within the WUI without necessarily arguing that every single community fits neatly into a particular box. So, um, so that was the, the basic motivation for, for the research. And the, the meta-analysis that we did and now published in, uh, in Forest Science uh, a year or so ago, um, we came up working with Cass Mosley and, and, and other researchers. We came up with sort of the first cut uh, at what we think the types of communities uh, that, are, that exist out in the WUI, um, with this typology being one that, that, that is linked to a, a notion of how might these places be different from each other uh, but but similar within their own within their own type, if you will, in terms of the way they respond to fire risk. Uh, we are not arguing that the four archetypes that we that we have suggested are the ones that we'll be talking about in five or ten years. This this I, these archetypes may very well change and adapt over time. They are a heuristic device to help us understand the complexity that exists out there in the WUI. And uh, any of you who may be uh, somewhat familiar with the, the classic literature in rural sociology will probably immediately see the impact of the notion of the rural-urban continuum uh, in, in our thinking on this, this particular diagram. Um, the, the, the notion that, that, that rurality or the lack of, of rurality, urbanity, if you will, uh, are not all or nothing, but rather there is a continuum. And, it, and, and based on the, on the case study work we had done, we, we recognized that th those communities that were more rural in character had certain responses that were different than, the re than communities that were more suburban or urban in character. And so this notion of a continuum uh, made a lot of sense to us. And so 
when we uh, when we did the the meta analysis, and we won't uh, bore you with all of the details of how we came up with these four characteristics or these these four archetypes. Um, but these were the four that that really fell out. Um, and so, um, what we'll do now, what I'll do now is is talk about each of them in, in turn, in terms of some of the the, the characteristics of, of each of these uh, community archetypes. So, starting at the more urbanized end of the spectrum. We have what we refer to as the formalized suburban wooly. This is a place where, where place attachment tends to be to, uh, to social networks within a relatively small place. Uh, that often some of these places can actually be gated. They're not all gated, but some of them are. Um, the, the notion of exclusivity, uh, certain um, uh, types of people live in certain places and other people don't live there because they can't afford to, basically. Um, uh, you have uh, what we refer to as gentrified amenity migration, the notion that people have moved to these places um, or built houses in these places because of uh, uh, of the particular neighborhood that they want to live in and the kind of people they want to live near. Uh, the, the collective identity tends to be at relatively small geographic scales. And collective action, we suggest, centers on, on social issues uh, at the small community level. We say these people have a low diversity of skill sets. That doesn't mean they're not smart, capable people. Um, and most of them are probably very good at running computers, but not very many of them are probably experienced at running a D4 cat or running a chainsaw. So their, their, their skill set tends to be more um, in, uh, at, at the abstract end of things and less at the, uh, at the, the concrete end of things. Moving to the next category, uh, the, the archetype we uh, referred to as the high amenity, high resource uh, community. Uh, this is where place attachments tend to be tied to outstanding amenities. Uh, people live there in part or perhaps in whole because of the, the setting in which they find themselves. There's significant amenity migration. People move to these places because they're beautiful. Think of Bend, Oregon. Think of places in the Front Range in Colorado. Um, the collective identity tends to be at either the community or the drainage scale, quite different than the sub more suburbanized place. Uh, uh, collective action is often um, centered around environmental management um, issues, not necessarily uh, for commodity production, but for a variety of things. Um, but in these places, you still have a predominance of, of professional folks, uh, with some people with more practical resource management skills, uh, but they're a bit like the suburban or suburbanized communities in the sense that there are probably more um, uh, professionals living in these places and, and, uh, and fewer blue collar uh, folks. Moving uh, along the spectrum, then we go to the, what we call the rural lifestyle um, wooly community. And this is where uh, place attachment tends to be tied to rural nature and to wildlands. Uh, there's some amenity migration to places like this, but not nearly as much because uh, they, they don't have the sort of national geographic uh, um, beauty that, that appeals to, to, uh, to, to at least some people. Um, the collective identity tends to be at the community or drainage scale, and it tends to be tied to rural ways of life. Uh, collective action uh, tends to be centered around rural challenges, making the schools and the roads uh, functional for, for people. Um, and there, there's a higher diversity of skills in the sense that you do have uh, professionals living in these places uh, with conceptual skills and abilities to write grant proposals or, or run a computer, but you also have people who do know how to run a chainsaw or a D4 cat and uh, and dig fire line or or uh, or do some of their own um, uh, landscape manipulation around where they live. Finally, the last category, um, what we refer to as a working landscape or resource dependent community. This is the type of community that I've spent a lot of my career um, working in. Before I worked on fire, I worked on timber dependence. And um, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with, uh, with the culture of these kinds of places. Um, place attachment tends to be very much linked to working the land. You often have intergenerational ties in places like this. Um, there's little to no amenity migration in places like this. People are there because that's where they make their living. They, they, uh, they make their living from the land. The collective identity tends to be at the drainage or county level. Um, there is less formal collective action um, 
uh, and, and agreement about uh, resource use. Uh, resource use. Um, and their skills in these places tend to be tied to uh, to just the resource uses uh, and also local ecological knowledge because these folks have often lived in these places for, for generations. So those are the four community archetypes that we have suggested uh, based on our analysis of a, of a quite wide variety of case study uh, in, in other research that's been done. And you might say, well, that's an interesting conceptual idea, but, but what is the relevance to dealing with the quote unquote fire problem? Well, we would suggest there's quite a bit of relevance here. Um, for example, uh, would residents in a particular place adopt FireWise, uh, capital FireWise? Now, um, and, and the answer to this is that play, in, in the more suburbanized communities, people are probably going to be more um, open to having experts come in and tell them what to do. But if you get to the other end of the spectrum, the more rural end of the spectrum, uh, that knowledge already exists in informal ways and formal programs are probably not likely to be um, very popular. Who does and doesn't evacuate during fires? Uh, I, over the years, I've uh, in interviewed literally hundreds of people who, who say that I, I evacuated the first time a fire came through, but I wouldn't do it again because I want to stay and defend my, my property next time. Um, why is that? What, uh, what, what do they know that we don't know? Uh, 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 about this and and uh, you know, what are the motivations and et cetera for for that? Um, who's willing to set up collective fuel breaks? What type of community would that happen in? Um, will there be conflict during the fire response? We've documented a fair bit of of conflict between um, type one and type two, particularly type one uh, firefighting teams and and locals, uh, local volunteer fire departments and and local people. Um, is prescribed fire uh, something that could be done in this particular place, or, or would it not be acceptable? Um, and who might refuse to participate in fuel reduction programs if they were suggested? So we think that all of these questions and many, many more um, are, are partially answerable by what is the type of community that you're talking about. And what are the characteristics that make up that type as well? Yeah, very importantly. So, um, and we would argue there's lots of practical differences. Um, and Travis will pick, the, pick it up in a couple of slides here and, and talk about where we're going from here with this. Um, but, but we believe there are important practical differences. Um, for example, um, where would formalized planning for mitigation work? Where would it not work? Um, very important factor in all of this is trust in government programs. Um, the farther out you go towards uh, towards the working landscape, the less trust there is in a federal and even state government programs. And, and so if you're going to design a program, you need to think carefully about that trust factor. Um, potential losses and impacts uh, in, in, in some places. Uh, for example, you know, we, we looked at a, a farming community that the people were more concerned about the productivity of the agricultural soil than they were their homes, um, as an example. And on the other side of that, you may have a community that's very tied to recreation or dependent in that way. And so losing that potential resource or having a watershed drainage that would potentially have some impacts would be something they're looking at. And so these values at risk differ significantly across these types. And, and, and people in these in different types of communities also tend to respond or themselves frame resource management activities uh, differently. Um, um, at, the, at, the, at the more rural end of things, local autonomy is, is more important. Restoration is very important in some places. Wildlife is very important in some places. But how you frame particular activities before, during, and after a fire um, is, is very important, and how, how that frame fits with the local culture that you're dealing with. So some other examples, you know, just to get a little more specific in these areas that we're calling high amenity, high resource communities that have those types of characteristics, often you have a better argument in line if you're looking at restoring ecosystem health, right? We're looking at reducing fuels. There's also this occurring, co-occurring aspect of going into people and saying, really, this is an unhealthy landscape, or you'd like to see more wildlife in this area, which many people may move out for that. 
if we were to thin some of these fuels, it's actually going to look a lot better, it's going to be healthier, and you're going to see more wildlife. And so we've seen plenty of instances of that and other people's work and ours as well, where a demonstration property, those kind of things goes a long way. So retaining that quality of those recreational activities, whereas on one half step away on that continuum, you may have rural lifestyle communities that are really more interested in doing this themselves to set up maybe a rural fire protection district that can do that initial suppression attack and setting up some kind of traditional resource use nearby, some more hunting, uh, some opportunities to go out and ride some four-wheelers, those kind of things. It's going to be a different prescription in terms of both what you're going to be doing to reduce those fuels, where you're going to be able to do it, and the scale at which these people would potentially support it or be on board. Their version of wildfire risk may be, they much, have a much higher tolerance, and there is plenty of research that would show that as well. So really what it gets down to is this is a continuum, and as Matt mentioned, there's no reason that we need to put nice little tidy boxes around this. The point was to show this range of diversity, but also to let people know that there's a tendency to think of this as a uniform kind of progression from that rural to urban or back and forth. And it really doesn't work out that way. One of the most important things to get at, and the reason why I have this slide up, is you may have these functional communities, at least the way we're describing them, that occur and change over time. And so the green in that case maybe would be a working landscape. Early on in many of the history of these Western landscapes, you had an economy and a culture that was tied primarily to agriculture, ranching, forestry, anything else. But over time, what happens is you get fragmentation in that social component of the WUI. But that has an important influence as well on the ecology that we have there, on the biophysical properties that are there, what we can and can't do in terms of managing that landscape, and all of these other dynamics that surround how we might respond to fires or how we might plan for them. So this idea that you're going to have a nice little kind of radiating out of these types isn't actually a good idea. What we should be focusing on is how fragmented that landscape is in terms of these cultural perspectives, in terms of these scales, and that can have a temporal dimension, it can have a geographic dimension. It's not the only one, but it's very useful for us to think of that because in a broad scale, communities and with fire risk, we see it as this collective problem. This is something that everyone has to take responsibility for. But the responsibility that would be necessary in these places is going to be somewhat dependent on how fragmented those perspectives are. It's going to be much tougher to get some of these collective ideas in place, maybe for fuel reduction or for community planning or for people to support the idea of zoning if you have perspectives that differ from house to house, whereas you may have larger functional units that you would work at. And so the idea is pick the scale that's most appropriate to actually tailor your efforts. And each place is going to have those different dynamics occurring. And that's an important thing that we want to get at with this idea of a continuum. So where we went with that is looking at this idea of pathways moving forward. If these places are different and they have different things that influence how they react to fire risk and how they continue to plan for it, can we find different ways that they can progress towards fire adapted communities where they all end up taking more responsibility, being more prepared for fire, having those fires serve a useful purpose in the landscape, but maybe do it through different means. And the way I always describe it as the choose your own adventure story. These communities, if they are different, they will select these different combinations of strategies that we already have. Maybe it is zoning and firewise. Maybe it is using a CWPP to prioritize collective fuel breaks in, in concert with at a neighborhood level versus a county level. What combination will they take? And so where we are going now is to look at these differences before, during, and after fires where we start to put together policies, incentives, and strategies that we've seen people use and try to see whether or not consistently across these archetypes or as a result of these characteristics, people are choosing the same strategies. So that then we could turn around and say, this is a decision support tool. If you have these things in place, if you're seeing these types of dynamics in your community, here's the best set of things to start with on your pathway to becoming fire adapted. And so, for instance, we may take a couple of these, and these are just examples, shortened versions of it. In a formal subdivision for WUI, you're going to be looking at strengthening your homeowners association power to be able to mandate some of these activities in the home ignition zone. We've seen that people are willing to do that. There are already a population who bought into this idea that they're joining a group of people that have collective standards. So that's a great leverage point to be able to institutionalize some of these efforts that we often see as inconsistent across populations. This is also a population that will look at building uh, and land use and home ignition zone codes that they'll vote on and that they will agree to be doing. 
ready, set, go. We talked about evacuation. This program is very well tailored for that type of group of people. They're, they want to listen to the experts and they want to leave early. You won't see as many people trying to fight the process or staying and trying to defend their properties. So on the other side, in a working landscape, if you go to the other side of that, that coin, you're really looking at building local initial attack. I recently did a study with a grad student of mine. We had a paper come out about Rangeland Fire Protection Associations, where now they're working with ranchers in the state of Idaho and also have been for a long time in Oregon to have these people be a part of the IC system, to give local resources and knowledge about how to attack these issues, and also to give people the opportunity to go in and maybe get their cattle out of harm's way. They're not leaving, so there needs to be a different pathway for them. This idea of vegetation utilization, in a working landscape community, you're much more apt to have people say, yeah, we're, we're on board with doing some fuels reduction, and we're going to do it to help out the local mill that's been struggling, those kind of things. You're going to need different recovery, long-term housing, those kind of things. And this is a community that has that very long-term connection to the landscape. And so this notion of a loss of the landscape, which is in the literature, is very important. Whereas if you have a huge fire that comes through, you're not just losing potentially the resource, you're losing the connection these people have to that landscape. And it's a useful way on the front side of promoting activities that are going to help reduce that type of impact. So I won't go through all of these, but we have these shortened example pathways for all of these archetypes. And so in different ones, in a high amenity, high resource community, you have these special interest groups or these smaller groups of people who have set aside uh, their social capital in order to mobilize in different ways. It's a great way to already use those. You already have a scale at which people are organizing. It's probably a good starting point. This is the population we see more CWPPs, but there's also a need for more of that education about what you can do around your home or why it is that this landscape maybe is unhealthy and the way it could be introduced as prescribed fire. So the point here is that all of these different communities might have different pathways. And what we're doing now is we're going out and we're actually testing across those. And so we're going out over the next couple of years on a series of projects where we've identified these places with local people of maybe where these potentially fit in the archetypes and the characteristics that matter. And we want to go through these differences that we're seeing uh, that they may enact in terms of different differences for policies and incentives and strategies. So are we going to be doing property level mitigations? Or are we going to be doing something broader with fuel breaks? Uh, who's going to be in charge in that governance model? Is it going to be led by the agencies or is it going to be more of a grassroots effort where the agencies are going to provide that technical assistance? Because we find that these things will stay longer and they'll perpetuate if there is something that's more amenable to the local population. So looking at the recovery side of things, we've been doing a number of studies on that. Who's going to need different types? The policies for proper recovering slopes that don't exist right now. So we want to look at all these things and what messages are the best to carry forward. Really what we're getting at is there is no one magic formula for creating a fire adapted community. I think a lot of the people who do this type of research recognize that. However, we do think that there are some pathways that are going to be more useful than others for these different communities. And what we've been doing over time is systematically building towards that. We don't want to just say off a one-off shot with one of these studies that we have the answer. The answer is going to be an emerging one and we're getting there through doing all these different works. So focusing on the means to which we get there, you can see the diagram of potentially giving people this decision support where they walk through choosing what's best for their community because they're going to play the hand that they have. They're going to work with the strengths. And so we're testing the pathways, but these hypotheses that different communities will enact these, these pathways that we're starting to see as we go forward. We're at a in a focus group in Sandpoint last year, Matt and I, and afterwards one of the fire chiefs came up to me and said, what kind of ologist are you? And I got taken aback by that for a moment, and I said, well, I guess sociology and ecology is what my background is in. And he said, you guys tend to make it complex in order to make it simple, but you got there eventually. And I think that's a good point for what we've been doing over time with our studies is we needed to understand the breadth of all these places and what may matter to them in order to make that heuristic that Matt was talking about. The reason why is because on the biophysical side and with that community cluster analysis, I, I mentioned the problems with the existing data we have is there's no land fire for people. I explain that all the time. We don't have very fine scale data consistently for people. And so what we've done is we've created that corpus of characteristics to help people have a consistent set of things that they look for. 
if we could do that and if we could show that those things matter, there would be an opportunity to use all that local knowledge that's there of the practitioners that I think have a better impression of this than any of the people who are doing research. We want to harness that. We want to be able to say, teach us what it is that we can do to make the policy better. But we needed this step in place. And so if you look on the side, you can see we have a key, a taxonomic key. In essence, what we're doing is making one for the complexity of social dynamics. We want people to be able to see what it is that's there in a place and feed that back up because this is a much better way. And over time, what we'd like to be able to do, you can see a photo series load there that some people use to maybe look at the fuels. We want to see the same kind of things for people. We want to be able to say these are the types of characteristics and also the types of homes that you're going to see in these different archetypes because oftentimes you can get a comprehensive picture and a story for the place in a lot of ways that just go beyond how they respond to a survey potentially. It's about the place, it's about what you're, what you're seeing in terms of patterns of people and the way they live with that landscape. The last point to make here is that really what we've been doing, the archetypes are great and they're a useful step in that process and we're testing that. But what we've really been doing over time and what we want to promote is we want to create theory theory for how people adapt to wildfire, which will have some crossover with other types of hazards or other types of change, but there are no theories that exist for fire adaptation. We always borrow from existing social science or existing, you know, in terms of resilience, if you want to say it comes from, from ecology, some may also say it comes from computer science. But the point is, is what do we have for fire that's an organic and a bottom-up process that helps us understand how people are changing in response to fire? And so we don't say that these archetypes will work everywhere. What we say is the process, this point of going through what conceptually matters across a diverse range of people and picking the individual characteristics that you start to see and then seeing those patterns, that approach is a very important one. And I think one that gets us to a better way of integrating human and biophysical properties of fire in a way that we don't currently do now. And on the subject of theory, some people are put off by the term theory uh, thinking it's it's uh, sort of just a cerebral exercise, but I would argue there um, uh, uh, theories of the middle range, uh, which is what we're talking about here. There's nothing so practical as a good theory if it helps you to understand the complexity of what you're dealing with. So this is not theory for theory's sake, but rather this is theory for uh, very practical uh, uh, applications. And, and I would just uh, add one another concluding thought. Um, uh, and, and we need to allow some time for questions. Uh, I don't think anybody who's on this webinar really has to be convinced how important this uh, the research, not necessarily our research, but the whole question of dealing with the fire problem and dealing, dealing with the WUI is. The land management agencies uh, cannot continue to, to practically to spend half their budgets on dealing with fire um, and, and really be able to do their jobs as, as, as land managers. And um, uh, the, the the big problem, uh, really, from their from from that point of view, is the fact that so much money is being spent protecting communities when the fires um, happen. If we can make communities more adaptable, so fires become less of a fires become more of a non-event, um, uh, then the land managers can get back to their job of managing the land. And and so. So really, that's the big picture reason why uh, we think that this whole endeavor of trying to understand fire and fire risk in the WUI is so important. It's not just because the communities are important, but of course they are, but it also uh, aims to restore more balance to, uh, uh, to, to land management as well. So thank you for that. Uh, with that being said, if anybody has any questions, that would be great. Well, I just, this is Carrie again. I want to chime in. Travis, Matt, that was awesome. I love the idea of the archetype that helps us to understand, more understand folks in the WUI, and I, I think this is great. So thank you so much for your presentation today. And like Travis said, let's go ahead and open up for some questions. Does anybody have any questions for Travis or Matt? Well, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I just want to let you know that coming up on December 14th, and that's next week already at 10 a.m., we will be hosting the final webinar in the fall webinar series. And this webinar will be a summary of fire season 2016 in Oregon, Washington. 
So we hope that you can join us on that one too. Um, so we have a question that asks, have you published any of this? <laughs> yep. So uh, the original the original version of that was in 2009 with the conceptual aspect of the WUI being diverse. Um, there was a 2012 paper that went further with those characteristics. The archetypes were published in a paper in 2015. Uh, Matt and I published one this year that was an overview with a couple case studies talking about how archetypes could be useful. Uh, and we also published a larger kind of conceptual piece about risk and community this year. Uh, there's also one that was this year that I was led with some other folks where we looked at a series of cases that were in very different archetypes to show how those people recovered from fire or considered fire events. And we have a number of papers uh, that are in development for that as well. So we've used it consistently and we've used it across a number of things. So we use it with alternatives to evacuation. We talked about recovery from fire. We talked about conflict during fire. And then we've kind of brought all those things together in some of the summary pieces. So there's plenty out there. And, and if anyone uh, wants some specific references, we'd be happy to pass those along uh, to Carrie and point out which ones would probably be a good starting point. But there is a lot there. That's great. And actually, I just posted your 2015 article with a reference there. And I only have one of them. But there's many out there for you all to, to have a look. So we also have a comment that says, uh, tremendous presentation. This is the kind of work we truly need at NFPA for the FireWise program. Great. We're, we're happy to hear that. That's really, uh, Matt and I come from a tradition that focuses on taking these dynamics and making them practically relevant. And that means working with, I noticed a lot of people who are listed as participants, we're really happy to see a number of people who are actually working with populations because we learn from you as well and then we hopefully get to see enough of that across places to make that something that we can go to policymakers with. So we hope that we can contact uh, a number of you in the future. We're going to be doing a lot of cases with different communities. Hopefully we get to cross paths and learn from you as well. And I was delighted to see that David C. Schultz from the Forest Service is, is, was in the audience this morning. He and I were co-authors of one of the early case studies that sort of laid the groundwork for uh, where we're going with this now as an example. Great. We also have a, another question. I saw that in your list of communities that Texas was not listed. Why is this, and do you plan to extend this research to us in Texas? We'd love to go to Texas. We just need the opportunity to do so. We've uh, Matt and I are both focused in the West, and it's where we've spent a lot of time, but we're radiating out. And so in the next uh, couple projects that we have had funded, the idea is to go beyond the West and to start to look at how those dynamics may change at different regions. And I think there is a tremendous amount of difference. Though the characteristics may still be relevant in some places, but I think we're going to learn a lot from that. So we'd love to come out your way, uh, and maybe we'll get a chance to, to do so. And I'm smiling at that question because people that know me personally know I have a great affinity for Texas and would love to work there. I think one of the reasons we didn't work there initially is because we tended to work in places with more public lands. But we now see that this work could also be conducted in places that don't have a lot of public lands. Um, and I, for one, would be delighted to to involve to, to get involved in some case studies in in, uh, in Texas in the Southwest, more in the Southwest. OK, we have a lot of questions coming in. So let me cool. scroll back up here. Um, one second. Uh, great work, very useful analogy to tailor wildfire mitigation program. And then we have the archetypes are definitely useful, but do you have evidence, anecdotal or otherwise, of people using these on the ground to aid in addressing WUI issues? Yeah, some of that started to happen. In fact, I got a text from someone that was, uh, they were at one of the trainings for prescribed fire and people were starting to mention it in that context as well in terms of what would be supported or where you might have an issue with uh, a prescribed burn in proximity to communities. So people have, other academics have started to use it. Uh, we've talked with the Fire Adapted Communities Network, and I know uh, they're amenable to that. And really what we'd like to do is build that in to these existing avenues to collect that information, because we don't want it to just be us going out and doing the studies. We want it to be something that everyone can help refine and provide that corpus of characteristics we can all collect. So existing 
avenues with the, uh, the self-assessment tool that the Fire Adaptive Communities Network has, has piloted or to be working with anytime you have a CWPP that you're updating to have a series of questions in there that the community collectively provides some answers for. These are ways that we'd like to start to move that conversation forward, to start to take it beyond uh, what we do and to work with other people in making it something that they take ownership over. Great. I've got a comment here, all in capital letters and exclamation marks. Come visit us at Austin Fire Department, Wildfire Division. <laughs> I try not to smile because he knows how much I happen to love Austin, Texas. So uh, let's let's make that happen. Let's make that happen. Great. We have a comment here from Russ that says this helps local fact groups plan for our different communities. Thank you. Great. We have another um, comment here. Um, let's just see. There's so many I have to. <laughs> well, one thing I'll mention is uh, for those who are interested, what we'd like to do at the end of the series of projects we have now, because we've, I think, finally gotten enough to get to that point, is we'd really like to create more of a formal uh, decision support tool or something that's a guidebook that starts to give that initial volley that people can help us refine that would be something people could take and walk through these steps and these different policies. And as we get there, uh, we'd really love to have people who are interested in testing it or to work with us in terms of refining it for their areas, uh, give us some feedback on that or pilot it out. Or maybe we can come out to where you are and work with some populations and say, is this a useful way to approach it? What could be clearer? And how can we make this tangible descriptions of places that people will recognize and, and have some ownership in? That's great. And Christina has a question. I think you just answered it. But do you have any community-tailored communications material available that you have developed based on this research? We, we did some, uh, some outreach stuff uh, through the EWP, the Ecosystem Workforce Project, when we were working on that project, some fact sheets. Uh, in terms of these practical guidebooks, that's our next step and something that we really want to work with people on. But we needed enough of these cases and we needed enough, you know, we're doing uh, some surveys as well to confirm some of these things and some tying it in with some modeling to be able to show that. And so that's really our next big step is giving something that's going to be tangible and uh, that people will want to work with. Great. And some people have asked again, yes, this presentation um, is being recorded and I will post it to both our um, Northwest Fire Science Consortium website and our Northwest Fire Science Consortium YouTube channel. Um, we have a question here from Rachel. Also, do you see these archetypes being applied differently in areas with more or less public land? And she says the, the Texas question made her think of this. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and like Matt had said, I, I'm not certain that, you know, the, it's not a mutually exclusive thing in terms of either those categories or what we've created in terms of the four. Uh, one of the things we want to do with these projects is go to places like Texas or Wyoming or the Midwest when we're dealing with a very different ecology, very different public land structure, and have it inform more archetypes that may be present. So I do think that that aspect of public lands, especially when you have a huge swaths of public lands like we sometimes deal with, it would make a big difference because that relationship that people have to those public lands or the history that they have in relationships with those agencies may be very different. And so it may be much more of a relationship with a state agency or a nature conservancy if they're the one who are doing prescribed burning in the Midwest. I think those are all fascinating things that will help us further refine what it is we're seeing in terms of the social diversity. Great. Great. I have something here from Jana. What about communities that are not organized around fire yet? Have you approached rural communities as outsiders to try to get something going? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point. And I think that, you know, community may exist at different levels regardless, but it's very hard to find a place, I would say, that's, that has no community, at least in the way that we conceive of it. You may have different types. And so, yes, one of the things that we tend to find, if, if someone's not already organized around maybe some existing program, we tend to go in and say, what is it that you guys do work collectively on? And so oftentimes in rural places, we find it's a road network if it's a very dispersed area. Or maybe it's at smaller scales that they collect and we've had people who will set up sheltering points because they know that they can't evacuate for fire. Well, those are the scales at which we work then. We look at the community that's already there and we don't presuppose that they need to build it some in some way. I also, think I also think there's an opportunity if there's some extension folks in the audience, and obviously 
extension folks are sponsoring this, but but we would we would welcome. I would I think I speak for both of us. We would welcome working with extension folks uh, on 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 working out some more of the, the practical aspects of this uh, in particular places. I, I I would welcome that that kind of an opportunity. <clears throat> Fantastic. This is something that I've been involved with. I've been doing some work in Southern Oregon, and this question from Kathy comes in. Great info, but the marijuana growing communities in uh, uh, Northwest California and Southwest Oregon might be outside of your archetype. Can you study these in these areas? Well, I, not not in this lifetime, but in a, my, my PhD dissertation was done in Siskiyou County, California. Um, and, and it was really all about logging and timber dependence. But I, I'm quite familiar with uh, with the, the whole marijuana growing um, uh, issue, at, at least as it was a few years ago. So um, that is a, an interesting twist uh, to, to the whole thing. Um, hmm. and, uh, what, what would you add to that, Travis? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a different dynamic of what you're having use of and that's one of the things that we focus on is if, if people are organizing around that or if there's a different I mean it certainly changes how you're going to deal with fuels and how you're going to deal with the ability to work with some people I mean up until you know still I imagine there's an aspect of secrecy there or a distrust of, of government uh, coming around that's probably going to be a difficult aspect to deal with and so I think in that case your partners are going to be people who already exist there I mean for that area of California in general, and this is someone who knows a lot about Fire Out to Community Network, um, the Watershed Training Center there is a great group of people who could be used as a champion for that effort. What we're struggling with in extension is um, there are so many of those people in uh, Southwest Oregon, and because we are um, uh, in part federally funded, we we can't actually help these people. We can't you know, offer them a site visit or, or things like that. So it's it's pretty tricky to mm -hmm. how to deal with the folks that are doing some marijuana growing. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so to be respectful of time, it is 11.02, and I just want to end with this last comment that um, – uh, a gentleman says, this presentation is great. This definitely helps us understand our populations in a more formalized manner. I look forward to hearing more about toolkits as they are developed for communicating with these different archetypes. With that, again, I'd like to thank Matt and Travis for talking with us today. I also want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen in today. And just a reminder for our upcoming webinar next week on the 14th at 10 a.m., a summary of the fire season 2016. Thank you so much, Matt and Travis. This was a really fascinating presentation. Absolutely. Thank and if you folks, very much. If folks want to contact us directly, our, uh, our emails are readily available. We'll be happy to communicate one-on-one -on -one with folks that have more specific uh, questions or interests. Great. Thank you. Thank you.